We're good? Okay. All right, uh, so this is uh, about Kubernetes and containers. Um, I will certainly talk more, but before I go any further, I kind of want to know who you guys are. So how many people here are full-time developers? Okay. Um, full-time systems people? Okay. I do both because I have to do both. Right. Okay. Anybody here I didn't cover? Did I did I miss people that tell systems and developer people what to do? Did I miss managers? No? Good. We can make manager jokes. They will fly. Okay. Um, how many people here are already using some sort of uh, container technology, like Docker or something else? Okay. How many people here have never used containers at all and don't... Everybody close your eyes for this. How many people will admit like they don't get containers and they don't know why we would use them? People just afraid to say this? Okay, no, I see, I see one or two. You can really open your eyes, that's okay. Um, so I might do a little bit of a preface for containers before I go further into Kubernetes. Does that seem all reasonable with everybody? Yeah? All right, and if it's too basic, like, feel free to like, yeah, all right, we got it, keep going. All right, so let me unhide these. Slide. And we'll talk a little bit about why containers. So, what's that? Use this mic instead? Okay. Well, then I'm going to take this off because this is not the most comfortable thing in the world. All right. So, where are we? So, we're at the matrix from hell. So, you guys probably have all seen a version of this, right, where you've got uh, multiple environments. Um, and so, you know, you're running OSX on one laptop, you're running Windows on another. Where you get all your packages from and all your software is all over the place. And so you run into the, you know, well, I don't know what the problem is, it's working on my laptop. And then you have to inform somebody, well, back your stuff up because your laptop's going to production. Um, so how do we solve this problem? We, this seems like a solved problem, right? We've moved to VM technology where you, you're running a little portable version of an OS inside your OS and you're all running fine. And this is good and it solves the problem, but it's not as productive in many cases, right? You make a change, you have to completely restart this VM, restart the OS, um, install new packages. Um, and that's not to mention the fact that we're taking up a lot of resources on this machine and you can overcommit, but everyone says, you can overcommit memory resources on VMs, but don't do it. Like every, everybody I've ever talked to says, oh yeah, you can totally do that, don't ever do that. And so, I could have liken this as, well, this solves a problem in the way if I have a laptop and I can't, a laptop bag and I can't fit everything in it, I could always strap a handle to an oil drum and carry that around. Um, but that's going to introduce new problems. So containers are an alternate solution. Containers share the same kernel as the, uh, the version of Linux you're running, and this is Linux only. Um, and it's fooled into thinking it's a full, full machine when it is in fact not. So you don't have to load up your own resources, you don't have to load up your own OS. You hit deploy and they come up within, you know, usually a fraction of a second. So they're a lot faster, they're a lot tighter to the resource constraints of your machine. And so they make kind of doing work with systems a little bit more productive. When you're doing development work on entire systems, they make it a little bit more productive. And so here's a Docker file, here's an example. This is running, this is a, a PHP front end, right? So you basically say, here from PHP, run this stuff and set up my environment with the code that I'm pulling in. Nothing too complex. And then we have this file that I can then take into any one of those systems that I had before. And so our hell, matrix from hell becomes something like this. It's more of a, I guess, purgatory matrix because um, we're still developing. Uh, but, um, so that's sort of a quick high level, here's why we want to do containers. Okay. So you like that. You're like, okay, I want to I wanna do containers. I, I like Docker. I'll move over to Docker. And so what is Kubernetes' involvement in all this? Well, so let's start with a very basic app. I've got front-end and services. So I've got my HTML, JavaScript, CSS serving, and my PHP serving, my, my API is on the same box. And I also set up a MySQL uh, server. And then I have an environment that looks a little bit like this. Okay, two containers. If I need to scale up, it's pretty easy. I can just add some more containers. Okay, but let's get a little bit more complex. Because someone will point out that, hey, this is really bad architecture. Running APIs and HTML, JavaScript, CSS in the same box with different tasks, we should separate them. Let's do that. 
So we make this just surfaces. And then we make this layer just Nginx, just to serve HTML, JavaScript, CSS. And so now our environment is a little bit more complex. Okay, still makes sense, still usable. Now, someone will come along and point out that, hey, you know, uh, containers, we talk about how great it is that they're ephemeral, uh, that they're temporary. Um, your database backend being ephemeral and temporary are not things that will make your users and stakeholders happy, right? So, okay. Well, we add a permanent disk, and this disk will live even if um, the container goes down, so it can act as a permanent storage. So now my environment looks a little bit like this, and I need to scale it out a little bit, so I add some more machines. Um, I can also, I'm sorry, more containers, and I could add some more copies of the, the back end. Um, but then this is all this is all one pretty app, and it's, it's great, but it's hiding an abstraction, which is all of these containers are still running on a machine with resources, and that machine is a single point of failure. Okay. Well, let's spin this up. Let's divide our containers among multiple, multiple uh, physical machines. And uh, we'll put the disk in the middle. And then if one of these machines dies, I have to move the containers over. And now, like, that's a lot to manage, right? So we went, to, went from managing systems to managing VMs to managing individual containers, but I'm still managing them. And so all I've done is add complexity in my environment without necessarily adding a lot of um, convenience uh, at a production level. So Kubernetes approach is a little bit different. You give it resources, and you say, run these many containers for me, and Kubernetes just does it. Um, let me explain how it does that in a, in a minute. But um, just to get the definitions out of the way, it's a container orchestration system. It is completely open source. It was started by us at Google, but we now have contributors from CoreOS, Red Hat, I believe IBM and I believe Docker, among the big names that are contributing to it. Um, and let's see, so let's get into some concepts. So before I go deep into what a Kubernetes looks like, what a Kubernetes cluster looks like, there's some concepts you need to have. Has anybody heard the metaphor cattle not pets before? Okay, I see a couple people. So cattle not pets says your system, you should run your system like cattle and not like pets. What's the difference? So a pet is, uh, has a name, right? It is unique or rare. It gets personal attention. And if it gets sick in the middle of the night, you get a page and you're up all night with that pet. Um, and so we all know those types of servers. So conversely, cattle has a number. One is pretty much like any other one. You just want a cattle. Um, you run them as a group. And if one gets sick, you make hamburgers. <laughs> Here's what I point out, animal husbandry being what it is, I, I don't think you should make a hamburger out of a sick cow. I think the British tried that and bad things happened. Um, so make a leather coat. Next concept, and we kind of understand how cattle would apply to computer. Like we just want containers. If they die, we just want to reinstantiate them and move on, not have to worry about data that's on them, so we store data off them, all those sorts of things. Desired state is the second concept. So the inverse of design. The inverse of desired state is something called uh, imperative, right? And it's build script. So I create Docker images, I launch a front end, I launch services, and I launch the back end. And there's my system running. And if one of these machines were to go down, there, um, unless I intervene, nothing, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to come back up. Something has to intervene, and it's usually, unfortunately, a person. Desired state works a little bit differently. I say, give me three of these, two of these, one of these. I don't care about the order that they start up in. I have built into them the idea that order doesn't matter when, uh, you know, so for example, for most of the services, they're gonna wait until MySQL is ready. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna ramp, the, do the kind of um, rolling check to see if it's up and then, and then instantiate connections. Um, and then if one of them dies, I don't have to do anything. It'll just come back on its own. And so that's desired state. And what I like in this too, is employees, not children. So <clears throat> if you have an employee and you tell them, hey, you know, we had a tough day. Go home, get some sleep. That's all you have to tell the employee, right? Like you don't have to go into more detail and you may not want to know more detail of your employee's personal life when they get home, but you can trust that when they get home, they're gonna go to sleep, they're gonna rest, and they're gonna feel better. <sighs> Those of you that have children know that this is how it works, right? You say, go upstairs, get undressed, Put on pajamas, brush your teeth, 
pick out two stories. And those of you that don't have children say, well, do you really need to go into that much detail? Do you need to tell them to go upstairs? And the answer is yes. Because if you look at the order, if you don't tell them to go upstairs, you will end up with a naked child in your living room. <laughs> and scripting is a lot of the same way, right? If one of the steps fails, you end up with seeing things that you don't want to see, right? So I like declarative as employee, not children. So we want our, we want our servers to be our employees and not our children. So now I'm going to go through a lot of like, here are all the constituent parts of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is really complex. Uh, I understand that. Uh, and so this is going to be like just a lot of like stuff thrown at you. But it's syntax that, and, and, and semantics that you need. So we'll try to get through it as best we can. So first I'm going to start with containers. Containers in Kubernetes are subatomic, meaning they are not the smallest thing that we'll ever interact with. We actually don't ever interact with them. Um, you interact with a higher level of abstraction than I'll talk about in a second. But um, it's important to know that you do use containers, it's just the higher level stuff you use as containers as their starting point. These are Docker files, just like if you're using Docker, just like you used in Docker. And in fact, all of my apps, I have a Docker path and a, sorry, a Docker set of commands to launch them and a Kubernetes set of commands to launch them. But the actual container stays the same. So I can develop locally using Docker and then uh, push to production in Kubernetes uh, the same exact files. So the smallest unit that you actually deal with is something called a pod, and a pod is an atomic component of Kubernetes. Um, it is made from one or more containers. Why would you want to put more than one container in a pod? Like, why would you want these two things in there? And that's because pods, all the containers in a pod will share IP address, namespace, and virtual disk. And so what this means is that um, I can combine them in very interesting ways. It is okay to have just one container. You look at the documentation, it'll very frequently say one or more containers, one or more containers. It's okay. You can just have one, it's fine. Most of mine are just one. But why would you want to have more than one? The canonical example we use is web server for, uh, plus file sync. So I've got a web server, and from a microservices standpoint, having a web server that syncs files also in the back end is no, right? Because it should be one thing and one thing only. So, but you want the file sync to write to some place where the web server can read from. So you separate them into two containers, make them part of the same pod, and then the, the microservices gods are appeased because I'm doing just file syncing on one container and just web serving on another. The other one I hear is, uh, so no one in here has ever done this, but someone you know, like a friend or someone, um, uh, launches like a lamp box to like test something out you know, like an all-in-one, just to test out, and then it becomes production, and then it's stuck in production, and you can't ever turn it off because people rely on it now. Again, never happened to anybody here, just <laughs> our friends. Um, so what you can do is rewrite the system layer to be all containers, have them all be on the same box, and you don't have to change the, the, the code, because the code is all pointing to localhost in a lot of cases, and then slowly migrate it off because that's what we should do, right? Slowly migrate it off that. You're, that's what your friend should do, right? That's what your friend should do, is get it off of that architecture. So that is pods. I'm gonna show the, and I apologize to this side of the room, it's not gonna be that visible, um, but this is a config file for Kubernetes. I'm gonna show it all on YAML, because YAML is a little bit more human readable than JSON, but you can if you hate YAML, as many, many people do, um, you can use JSON. The key p points that I wanna point out here is, um, so I call it a pod and I give it a name PHP because that's what this is and I'm pointing to an image. Now this could be just a Docker image and it will call out to the Docker repository and pull it down. Um, but you can also use custom repositories um, like this one that's uh, gcr.io. So here's the thing, you never actually launch a pod, right? Because pods don't know about falling over. So there are reasons why you might launch a pod for some reason but you never actually really do it. You launch these things called controllers. And what controllers do is they observe, do a diff, and act. So they say, what's our current environment? Our current environment is we have two. What's our desired state? Our desired state is three. Hey, they're different. Launch a new one. Or if they, it went the other way, you know, take one down. These are pretty complex, but you'll notice they contain a pod within them over on the right. So same sort of deal. Uh, enable replicate controller, and there's my pod. There's also this thing called replica set, which is what everybody's moving to now. They are exactly the same as replication controllers, um, 
the syntax to column is just a little bit different. The reason I point this out is that they are um, they're new, and all the documentation points to replication controllers, but you can just swap in replica set for them, and they'll work just fine. And what's great about them, oh, I, oh, I didn't put the config in. Well, oh, because the config's here. They're part of something called a deployment. If we look at the config for that, this is exactly the same as a replication controller, but it is a little bit smaller, okay? Um, you'll see there, same sort of pod definition, but everything is smaller. This is exactly the same as the other one that was really, really big. All right, we're getting to the end of this. Um, the next thing is service services. So we don't care about our pods, right? Like, they can go away, that's fine. But they have IP addresses and we want to communicate with them. We want to get the data off of them. How do we do that? We do this thing called a service. And a service basically is an IP address that is named. So in this case, this is front end because they're red. So that, that IP address is, um, is a, is, will also have a DNS entry, and that DNS entry will allow you to write code that points to it without having to know the IP addresses of the systems involved. So basically, it's for defining a set of pods that work together for a common purpose. You get a virtual IP address, and it's also used for exposing it either internally to other parts of Kubernetes or externally as like a load balancer or whatnot. Um, by the way, I see you taking pictures of every shot. That's cool, but it's online and you can download it. Yeah, and at the end I have the URL. So if you don't, if you want to save memory space, I'm happy to let you do that. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, this is what the service looks like. Pretty basic. Um, I just give it a name, front end. This one is a is a publicly available, so it's a load balancer. It's going to get a public IP address, and uh, I just basically say root root port 80 on the outside to port 80 on the inside, and that's all there is to it. So, I'm going to skip labels and selectors. Basically, it's how you point all these things at services. Um, last piece I'm going to go through that's just all just me speaking data at you is networking. Um, all pod, all pod ID, uh, IPs are routable, which means that any pod can talk to any other pod directly, as opposed to Docker, where you have to go up to the Docker host and back down. Um, and it could do that across physical nodes. So it's great, it makes communication on the on Kubernetes really easy and you don't have to like, you don't have to configure each, each individual port on the host to pull down. All right, so I threw a whole bunch of data at you, I'm gonna sum it up really quickly. <clears throat> Kubernetes uses containers, but you never actually use a container, right? Because you put everything in a pod, but you don't actually call pods because they don't stand up by themselves, they do replication controllers. But we don't use replication controllers anymore. We use these things called replica sets. But you don't make a replica set directly. You make it in something called a deployment. And all of this you serve up via a service. Simple, right? You got it? Oh, everybody? So play around with, if you play around Kubernetes, this will all eventually make sense. Um, but it is very complex. It is not a simple, like, you know, spin up and here's this awesome thing. It, you, have to, you have to put a little work and really want it. Um, and there are reasons why you might want to, but I just figured I'd point that out. The other reason why there's sort of so much like, here's this thing, we don't use it anymore, we use this thing, is that um, the Kubernetes project is very, very active. Um, about two weeks ago, I did a hackathon for Kubernetes. We're trying to encourage people to contribute. And um, I was trying to afterwards count up how many contributions we had, but I couldn't actually tease it out because the average day of contributions like, and when we say contributions, I mean a, a change list, a, a, a pull request on GitHub. Uh, we could get like 30 a day. Um, so it was hard for me to figure out which ones were the hackathon and which ones were just people who were actively involved and enjoying themselves. So it's a very, very active project and stuff is really changing with it. Um, but for the most part, that's good. We try to make sure everything is backwards compatible and we're not deprecating things that people need. Um, or are relying on, but just be aware that it's pretty fast moving. So, I want to show you a Kubernetes cluster in action. Uh, I'm going to show the process of it spinning up and uh, try to show you all the constituent parts of it. Before I do, there's a whole bunch of stuff I kind of have to yada yada um, because it takes like 10 minutes to do. It takes anywhere from two minutes to 10 minutes. If I do it in front of people, it takes 15. Right? <laughs> uh, and it's a lot of like screens scrolling past you and it's not, um, it's not that interesting. So the first thing I did was spin up a Kubernetes cluster. Um, a master with uh, Kubernetes nodes. I also built a disk because uh, the app has persistent storage. 
I also built two Docker containers, um, built the images, and then pushed those images up to a Docker repository. All right, that all sets it up. It is a very simple app. It is a front end in PHP um, with HTML, JavaScript, PHP on the front end with MySQL on the back end. And it is, I know you've never seen anybody show off by demonstrating a to-do app, but I'm gonna do it this one time. So don't be too shocked by a to-do app um, and bootstrap even. So okay, so that's the app. I'm gonna try to do this while holding this uh, mic. We'll see how successful I am. Okay, we'll close that. And can you guys, anybody who can actually see the screen, can you read the, uh, is it, it's too dark? Too dark, okay. Hmm. Yep. So hold on a second. There we go. Yep. Basic. No. no. Okay. Um. Hmm. Yep. Then I'll mess it up. For me. Hold on. Use. Uh. No. I missed it. Okay. All right. This is this is this is what kills me. Right. I I, I had you. You're all like, yes, this is awesome. Guy does not know how to do his thing. Um, yeah. Okay. No. No. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna fail. That's okay because the output is usually a little bit brighter. Um, no, that's not gonna work. Oh wait, did that work? Oh, you're gonna change it. Thanks. I'm on I'm on stage and I'm just like. Ah. There we go. All right. All right, hold on. I gotta do a little typing here. <laughs> Drama. Oh, nice. <laughs> See, that is that is a room lead. That is a that is a pro room lead. All right. Yeah, I set up everything ahead of time, and now I'm all out of sorts. So, I'll get some bigger. All right, can we read the screen now? We're good. All right. Sorry to bring my hipster dark. Uh, I can do it. I, I think I can do it. All right. Everything else is just me typing a little bit, and it's fine. So, first thing I'm going to do is I, uh, I'm not going to type out stuff for you. As as you see, when stuff goes, I, I typo, and it gets really ugly. So, I'm just going to use make commands, and it should pop up the commands that I have to run. This is going to help us see exactly what's going on as it happens. So, deploy. Okay, and we should be launching our app. So you'll see that I'm applying uh, a bunch of uh, YAML files. Oh, is this running? Yeah, there we go. Okay, I just need to be refreshed. So you see that it popped open some uh, containers. The containers are the light gray things here. This in yellow is my MySQL container and is of course taking a little bit of time to start up because it is MySQL. Um, just takes a little bit longer than PHP. The dark green up at the top, I know it's hard to read, I apologize, is a public service, so that's gonna get a load balancer IP and it doesn't have one yet, but it will get one. And then MySQL is back here. It's light green because it's private because the only thing that talks to it are the containers. Okay, so I have my environment and we're waiting for a public IP address, which is fine. So I'm going to type some stuff. And I'm gonna see a list of all the pods that are running. And because they're running as part of a deployment and they're cattle, I don't really have a name for them. I have these like really annoying long names, uh, which is fine. And I'm gonna show you how much I don't care about them. I'm gonna kill one of them. Yeah, delete pod, there we go. Now watch very carefully what happens to the visualizer up at the top. I'm gonna kill one, it's deleted. You'll see on the visualizer, one goes red, one comes up yellow and then goes to gray, what happened? Well, I said I always want two, and I made a situation where there weren't two, so it said, hey, fix, and boom, it started up a new one. Um, that would have worked even if I uh, shelled in and then killed it internally with, like, you know, without running through Kubernetes, it would still bring it back. So, we're now live, uh, we have an IP address, so I'm gonna launch that IP, and you'll see there's a whole bunch of data. 
Why? Because I have a persistent disk on the back end that I kept. And so when the container system came back up, MySQL used it, and we're now running on the same data. And you'll see it says things like, I did this in my hotel room to provide proof of persistence and other things. So real quick, we'll just, uh, and uh, we'll see that it saved it. And I wonder what I was supposed to do there in the future. Now, okay, I have a code change, right? Someone comes along and says, uh, well, it's, it's CSS, but it's still code, right? So the CSS all change. We hate this light layout. We're cool and hipster. We want to have uh, dark layouts now. Okay, so that's a code change. I have to make a new image. I have to push it up. I've already done that, but how do I roll it over? Rolling it over is pretty easy. I have a YAML file set up to do just that. So I'm just going to clear this. And I'm going to say make update. And then watch the visualizer. Uh -huh. So what's happening is it's rolling through and it's starting up these new dark versions of them. And you'll notice that rollover happened really, really fast. You can time it differently. And in fact, you probably want to. This is for a demo. I want it to be fast. I don't want to be waiting for the containers to spin up. But I switched over seamlessly. And so now my new layout looks like this with the dark hipster layout, which is not working in this room at all with the, with the way the projector But it's there. It's not cooler, but it's fine. So the last thing I want to point out is a lot of times with Kubernetes, people say like, it's great because we can run all this stuff. We want, to we want to compartmentalize all this stuff that we have to run. Like marketing wants us to run WordPress, and we hate you for making us run WordPress, or Drupal, or whatever. So I'm going to spin up a whole kind of whole group of apps all in one shot. Um, I'm going to do it here. It's basically just the same stuff that's been going, so I don't feel guilty about doing another dark one. And we should spin up a whole bunch of systems. So I'm going to spin up a WordPress instance, a Drupal instance, a light version of this, um, and a Node app. Um, and you'll see they're all spinning up. They take a little bit of time. They're all getting, they're all getting their basic architecture set up. There's our Node app, and there is WordPress starting up. So, very quickly, I can spin up an entire, you know, set of applications using Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will manage them all um, with the same sort of idea that, you know, there are two of these, there's one of these, and whatever I set up will work and go and work forward from there. I'll show, them, I'll, I'll show them off a little bit more in a second, just showing that they exist and they're real. Um, but I'm going to sum up some things just to do some time management. Um, we talked about a couple things in there. We talked about rolling updates. We talked about persistent volumes. Um, there's also some more things that I want to show off, one of which is secrets. Um, so secrets are for storing information that you don't want ever to get into GitHub. Right, so it's like passwords and, and other private things. Um, Kubernetes has an interface for this, and it allows you to either mount the data as files, so each secret becomes its own file, or you can push them directly into environmental variables. And they look something like this. So here's my secret. That's base64 encoded, so you still don't ever want this to go into a like repository. You, you want to keep these uh, files private but they're obscured so that someone just can't look at them and know exactly what the password is. And then in your pods, uh, where, wherever the pod is, is defined, whether it's in a service or, I'm sorry, whether it's in a replica set or a replication controller or a pod, um, you basically just line these up so that it'll inject username will be my secret, whatever the key for username was, and password will be my secret password. Other thing that's really cool is a horizontal autoscaler. So this is really hard to demo, but basically right now with, um, with our replica sets, we say give me two, give me three, and that's really independent of how much you need, right? You're just guessing, right? And you can, you can guess intelligently if you want, but it'd be better if it would monitor how much those things are being used, and as you need more, spin more up, and as you need less, spin them down. And so horizontal autoscaler does that, um, and it allows for pods to auto-scale, but not for nodes. So this is important. Um, you can, you know, eventually what will happen is it'll try to spin up pods and not be able to because 
you're at the, re the limit of your resources, and that's fine. We have ways of doing that, but that sort of lives outside of Kubernetes. So here I just set a uh, target CPU utilization. I say it's a deployment, and I want minimum of one, maximum of five, but you can set that maximum to whatever you want. And uh, I have a demo for the autoscaler, um, but I'm gonna, in the process of, in the pursuit of time, I'm gonna skip it. Um, and there, we see all our stuff is up, by the way, so if you wanna see WordPress uh, from Kubernetes, really that easy. Same thing with Drupal. Uh, go. Oh. Drupal has, no, there we go. It has a whole bunch of caching issues. Um, I don't know from. And then this Node app is, um, it's a creepiness app. Long story short, uh, me and my coworkers are trying to, to, try to, to convey creepiness to people and like a level. And so this is level one, which is just Christopher Walken, who is sort of creepy, but he, when you really think of it, he's, he's kind of harmless. He doesn't have any big scandals or anything. So okay, so that is uh, Kubernetes. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. Um, there are a whole bunch of things I did not talk about. We have things like, you know, we have logging, we have monitoring, um, there's a web interface, there's config maps, and there's jobs. So less, like, just start up, I have a queue of stuff, I want to knock it all out, spin up containers to start up the job, and then when they're done, they, they spin down. So, a lot of times people ask questions about how does Kubernetes line up with all these other technologies. So. Docker Compose allows you to do multiple containers on the same local host. Docker Swarm allows you to do clusters, uh, cluster of container hosts. And uh, Docker Machine allows you to do manage remote container hosts and launch container hosts in several clouds. Kubernetes sits sort of in the middle of some of these abilities and adds some extra things like routable network, replication controllers, replica sets, job sets, and auto scaling. Also, Docker's logos are in fact much cooler than ours, and I will totally admit that uh, because they are and they deserve it. Um, the other thing that comes up is Mesos. Mesos is a multi-machine kernel. It turns a data center all into one logical system, and it can do containers, um, but it also can do other distributed jobs, and that's what a lot of people are using it for. Kubernetes is management software for containers. It's very opinionated about containers. It's where it started. It just does containers, but it can run on top of Mesos. And what's cool is if you run Kubernetes on top of Mesos, that's one of the ways of getting, so I said you could horizontally scale out uh, pods until you run out of resources. Mesos can handle giving you more Kubernetes nodes to give you extra resources to run those uh, pods. So, container engine. I, up until now, I've been talking about developing on Kubernetes. What does it look like? How do you configure systems? Um, but I haven't talked about how you install and manage Kubernetes itself. So you have to set up a cluster. And first, you have to choose like an infrastructure. And that could be Google Cloud Platform, or AWS, or Azure, or Rackspace. I certainly have opinions about this, but I'm not going to beat them too over the head. Um, then you choose a Node OS, right? It's Core, or Red Hat, or Scent, or then you provision the machines, right? You build boot VMs, and then you install and run Kube components on it. And then, uh, let's see, then you configure networking, which is another step. And then you start cluster services like DNS, logging, and monitoring. And then you have to, man oh, I'm getting so exhausted here. And then you gotta do kernel upgrades and OS updates and hardware failures. Um, so you have to manage all of this. Or if you go to Google Cloud Platform, there's this thing called Container Engine. And there's like a little button. And you just press the button and it does all of that for you. And I say that as a joke. Uh, but there's a bigger truth here, which is that um, Kubernetes is, Container Engine is hosted Kubernetes with a few smart defaults set. And it's really good for allowing you to dip your feet in. It's a lot of work to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Container Engine makes it really, really fast. And so you can use it to test, like, like maybe your infrastructure all the AWS are all on-prem, and that's cool. You can run Kubernetes there. But before you actually figure out whether doing all this work to get there, you can test on us. Um, and it also allows for node auto-scaling. So if you, you, run in, you run out of pods, you can set it up so it'll build more pods and then nodes. I'm gonna skip this real quick, in the interest of time. And a couple quick conclusions. So Kubernetes is open source. We want help. Kubernetes.io, github.com slash Kubernetes slash Kubernetes. Um, roadmap. Um, next version coming out is Kubernetes 1.3. Target is June. 
it is getting there, guys. So um, they're usually good within a month. So if they say it's going to be out in June, it'll be June or July. Two big feature sets here. Um, Ubernetes, which is cool sounding, and it is federated Kubernetes cluster. So right now, you have a single cluster. Um, you want it to talk to another cluster. They're just two separate things, and they don't understand each other. In the future, you'll be able to federate them together so they can share loads and pods across them. This will allow you to run part of your environment on one Kubernetes cluster, one of your part of your environment, another cluster. So in theory, you can run in multiple data centers or even multiple cloud, cloud providers. So you could run a little bit on us, a little bit on someone else, a little bit on-prem. Um, it's pretty cool uh, when, it, when, it, when it hits. And then as part of being able to support us more on other cloud platforms, we're adding, it works on AWS and it works just fine on AWS, but it works just as well as it would on-prem. Whereas this allows you to take advantage, we're going to add some features to allow you to take advantage of some AWS's better features for managing these things. If you like Kubernetes, but you're wondering like, what the hell make it hand here? Because that, that configuration was a lot. Container Engine can make dipping your toes in a little easier. And one of the things we do in Google Cloud Platform is we give away $300 uh, and for two months. So you can totally, and this is, you can totally do this, sign up for the free trial with no intention of moving forward with us. Use Container Engine. If you like it, great install Kubernetes wherever you want. Um, and if you don't like it, well then you used our money to try out. And this is where you find out I'm a sales guy. I'm, I'm not a sales guy, right? No, I'm not a sales guy, this is bad sales. I totally want you guys to try out Kubernetes and this is a great way to do it. And I don't care that we will pay for it. Um, so Google has been developing and using containers for about 10 years. We have come to the conclusion that containers are the only way that we can manage scale. We grew faster and uh, bigger 